It's been an honor uh, on three occasions to be escorted around Great Britain with my good friend John Churcher, speaking in various churches and a few other educational events, progressive meetings of different sorts. And I do love being in Great Britain, but in very many ways, England is a lot like the United States. You see the same sorts of products in the stores. You go shopping, you see the same things you would see in our department stores. But we're so much the same that where we are different, those differences inevitably become conversations that are repeated almost anywhere we go. We jump in the car, we drive a few hours, we get out at the next spot. I deliver a lecture and during the Q&A, someone will bring up the same subject or two. And one of them is that British people still insist that there is such a thing as really good fish and chips. I, I know my way around the restaurant industry, and I know that if you've got a really good piece of fish, you either serve that raw on a little bit of rice, or you lightly sear it. If you've got okay fish, you either broil it or blacken it. But if you've got fish that's about to go bad, you batter it and fry it. I've worked in restaurant kitchens. I know things. And it doesn't help just putting it in a sheet of newspaper. But the most common topic of conversation, after the obligatory chatting about whether our president is dumber than their prime minister, is America's fixation on guns. And they normally are very polite about it to the point that it almost, it almost seems painful trying to formulate the question, how can a, how can a country like America, so advanced in so many ways, not be able to get a handle on this problem? There were 40,000 gun-related deaths in the United States last year. Most of them were suicides. But there were over 100,000 more people that were injured in gunshot wounds than died. We're just uh, three-fourths of the way through the year now, and it looks like in this pandemic year that the number of gun deaths will exceed 50,000, literally more than the number of people who die annually in automobile accidents. Our English cousins who birthed our language and so much of our culture, and, and they were famous for cruelty uh, during their uh, conquest and empire building days in the past. But in, the, in recent years in England, they have had 50 to 60 gun deaths per year. Do you hear what I'm saying? Our gun deaths are not twice as bad as Great Britain, not 10 times as bad, not 100 times as bad. Our gun deaths are nearly a thousand times as many as in Great Britain. A thousand times. Why? It is true enough that we have a gun culture in America. Still, our depictions of the gun-slinging Wild West days of America's youth are grossly exaggerated. Then and now, a media report of high-profile events tends to give the impression that these things happen all of the time. It's, it's the airplane effect, that the airplanes don't get into the news unless they crash. So you have an assumption that every time an airplane takes off, it crashes. For example, Jesse James and his notorious James gang, they ran a 12-year-long crime spree of robberies that gave them nearly celebrity status even during their lifetimes. And while they were violent, even still, in 12 years, seven members of their gang were killed, and they may have killed eight or nine other people. Now, by comparison, there have been over 500 people killed in mass shootings in the United States this year, and I suspect not a person here could name a single incident. It doesn't become newsworthy unless it happens in a school. School shootings get attention, but during the pandemic, most schools have been closed, and so school violence has become much more rare. 
No, much more than our heritage of the Old West gun violence in America, most of our current gun violence is a modern phenomenon. And it won't surprise you to hear me say that it's largely fueled by capitalism. When I was young, which unfortunately has been half a century ago, members of the National Rifle Association usually came into our schools to talk to us about gun safety and hunting. Their message was more cautionary than encouraging. They were letting us know guns are dangerous and that they have to be handled with extreme caution. But in the past few decades, the NRA has become merged with the corporate interests of gun manufacturers, whose only interest is to get you to buy more guns. So in order to sell more guns, they pull the strings of our, you know, we call it political contributions, but let's call it what it is, political bribes. They, they pay political bribes in order to make all of the legal impediments to gun ownership so minuscule, so distant, that it's easy for people to make a living in it. And this is anecdotal, but, but, it, but I think it's representative. I was sitting in a coffee shop, and there were four attorneys sitting around a table next to me, and I couldn't help overhearing them discussing the fact that none of them were making a very good living in their law practice. And one of them confessed that he was making about $8,000 a month selling AR-15s online. He could buy them and then sell them online without, because it's an individual trade, people who couldn't pass a background check could buy one online at a grossly inflated price. So this attorney knew that he was selling high-powered killing machines to people who couldn't legally buy one. But it's a profitable industry in the United States. And this very weekend in Springfield, Missouri, there's a gun show at our fairgrounds where hundreds, if not thousands, of criminals who could not buy a gun legally are out buying guns and ammunition just a few miles from here. I hope they can't hear me. Our gun violence is directly related to one thing, and that one thing is the presence of millions of guns, hundreds of millions of guns. Now, there are some examples of other countries with high rates of gun ownership and a low gun rate death, uh, rate of death from gunshot wounds, but those are typically countries with very strong hunting traditions and fairly sparse populations. For the most part, more populous democracies maintain a low gun death rate by making gun ownership, at least in your own home. You can own a gun in England, but you've got to leave it at a gun club. You can't just keep it at your house. You can't have a domestic violence dispute and start shooting. You have to go to the gun club and check it out, and then the gun has to be checked back in. But in our culture, I grew up around guns. There were guns hanging on a gun rack in my bedroom where I grew up. But as an adult, I don't own a gun. I have known many retired military officers in my life, and none of them that I knew owned guns. It has been my honor to know three retired colonels, all of whom had extensive training in how to handle guns, and every single one of them refused to have a gun in their home. Do you know why? It, this is what they said to me exactly over different decades as I had these gentlemen in my, in my parishes. They said, guns are dangerous. So why do millions of Americans own guns? As I've mentioned, the number one reason is because they're insanely available here as they are not anywhere else. But what is the motivation of the buyer? First and foremost, it is fear and insecurity. Sometimes that fear verges on paranoia. But you know, sometimes it doesn't verge on paranoia. Sometimes it's clinical paranoia. And I can assure you 
that everyone in America who is clinically diagnosably paranoid owns several guns. And that simple fact should be very sobering to all of us. But the insecurity, male insecurity, is another huge driver. You know, it is my job to tell the unvarnished truth in public. Oddly enough, it doesn't actually say it in my job description, but in truth, I am paid. My employment is predicated on me telling hard truths in public. It doesn't win you a lot of friends, but when I cash my paycheck twice a month, I am doing that because I have said things into this microphone that many of you didn't want to hear. So... Here we go. In our culture, women in general are made to feel insecure about their age and their appearance in ways that men are not. The fashion industry alone is a $2.5 trillion industry globally, and in the United States, it's over $400 billion. We spend another $50 billion in makeup. 100 billion on hair and more than 16 billion on plastic surgery most of which are breast implants women are often convinced to dislike their own bodies and so they are they compensate for their insecurities in ways that men just don't look those of you that are regular viewers have you noticed that i've worn the same three sports coats for 12 years you, you haven't. But let a, let a woman who's like a television news commentator wear the same dress twice in a month, and she'll get buried in emails because the fashion industry has the fairer gender really just jumping through hoops. And other than Donald Trump, who spends reportedly $70,000 a year on hairstyles, Look at us. <laughs> We're not spending a lot of money on makeup and hair. But he probably has makeup delivered by the truckload. I don't know. If, well, no. Uh, I'm not going to say that it's blackface, but that shade isn't his shade. Do you understand what I'm saying? Men don't get breast implants. Very few men wear makeup. We're clearly saving a fortune by not spending anything to make ourselves look better in terms of fashion or hairstyles or makeup. But what does a man do when he is insecure about his masculinity? What does a man compensate, how does a man compensate, if he finds himself being afraid of minorities or the prospect of criminals breaking in or immigrants moving into the neighborhood or if there's something in his underwear that doesn't impress him and he sure isn't going to impress anyone else. Clearly, the more than $20 billion spent on guns every year in America is not about hunting. It's about insecurity. Just as a sidebar, Americans spent $17 billion on ammunition during the Obama presidency. Because, as you may have noticed, Obama is black. Insecurity drives the gun market. And unfortunately, men are very simple creatures. You tell them, Carter's coming for your guns. Clinton's going to take your guns away. Obama's coming for your guns. And now Biden is going to do away with the Second Amendment. Trump is out stumping every day on the campaign trail telling these grossly insecure, simple men that if they don't reelect him, their Second Amendment is as good as gone. When no one has ever come for their guns. Not Carter, not Clinton, not Obama. They probably should have, but they didn't. And Biden sure won't. That some American president is coming for your guns is the grown-up version of being so afraid of the monsters under your bed that you regularly wet your bed out of fear of getting out of bed to go to the bathroom. Now, that's harsh, I know, 
suggesting that gun owners are the grown-up version of anxiety-riddled bedwetters. But what do they have to say for themselves? If they are collecting heavy, assault-style military rifles with large round-capacity magazines, you know they're not hunting. How do they explain why they are collecting all of this ammunition and these guns? In 1989, when the sales of these sorts of rifles started to shoot up, there was a spurious fake quote attributed to Thomas Jefferson that started to make the rounds. It claimed that Jefferson said, and he didn't, Jefferson didn't say this, but it claimed that Jefferson said, the strongest reason for the people to retain the right to keep and bear arms is, as a last resort, to protect themselves against tyranny in government. Now that seems a little crazy to think that private citizens, no matter how well armed they may be, could actually stand up to the military power of the United States Army and Air Force or Navy. But at least to some degree, it has been tried. The incident at Ruby Ridge in the early 90s, the shootout with Clive and Bundy, uh, uh, or the standoff with Clive and Bundy in 2014. But let me ask you to consider this. If all these millions of guns held by hundreds of thousands of people in case our government becomes tyrannical, if that's why they're doing it, then why have none of them done anything to liberate thousands of children held in cages on our border? For three years now, in a lawless, insane, immoral federal policy of taking children, some so young they were literally taken from their mother's breast to be locked up in cages. And this is being done to scare immigrants into not coming to the United States. And folks, this is not hypothetical. We've accused this administration of this for years, but there have recently been transcripts released of meetings in which Trump officials, <laughs> including Jefferson Beauregard, our previous uh, Secretary uh, uh, Justice, um, Attorney General, sorry, took me a minute, uh, verbalized the methods and intents of taking children away from parents in order to slow border crossings. What could be more immoral than that? If you're looking for a sign that your government has become tyrannical, what more would it take? Oh, and by the way, some of the kids have died. They've, some died from lack of medical care. Others died from starvation or dehydration, not giving the kids water. And all this QAnon stuff that's accusing uh, the government of being run by pedophiles, many of these children have been sexually assaulted. So if the QAnon folks were actually concerned about pedophilia, we know where it's happening. And they say they've got all these arms against tyranny, but they're not doing anything. Where is our well-regulated militia protecting us from government tyranny? Not once have any of these organized paranoid clans of bedwetters made an attempt to save these children. So let's just drop the pretense that this has anything to do with liberty or defending democracy or freedom or even good government. All that is a lie. None of this gun hoarding is about virtue of any kind. It's about fear and insecurity and a degree of selfishness that honestly I find hard to imagine. This sad little group of lost boys whose mothers didn't love them enough to breastfeed them, who dubbed themselves with the comic book title of the Wolverine Watchman, actually were plotting to overthrow Michigan's government and kidnap Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Why? What would make them organize secret meetings and actually try to cook up such a, a horrifying plot? <clears throat> because Governor Whit Whitman, Whitmer, quite noticeably, is a woman. 
And these insecure men couldn't stand that this woman had authority over them to place emergency measures in order to slow the spread of COVID-19. The state's legislature and Supreme Court appears to have joined with the Wolverine Watchmen in doing absolutely everything they can to fight every measure she takes, tooth and toenail. But this band of Boy Scout wannabes actually listed among their chief complaints for why they were going to kidnap and murder her was that she had closed their gym. These spoiled brats wanted to overthrow their state government and commit murder because they were being prevented from having their workouts. For many years, I believed that the National Rifle Association was the enemy of reason in America. The pandemic has, however, added fuel to the fire of gun lust and brought out of the shadows more fringe groups for whom the NRA is not pro-gun enough. It's difficult to draw direct lines from this terrorist cell to their influences, but one of the biggest groups to build a coalition of what even NPR has called similarly paranoid, uneducated, frightened white people is the Minnesota gun rights group led by the Door Brothers, who believe that NRA stands for negotiating our rights away. Combining a paranoid, almost anti-anarchist uh, uh, worldview with the worst of Old Testament restrictions that called for stoning women who were unfaithful and killing men who were gay, all of which gets wrapped up in the now infamous QAnon movement, which Trump simultaneously claims to know nothing about while loudly protesting that someone has to put a stop to Antifa and his other imaginary boogeymen. Aaron, Chris, and Ben Dore, operating under several names on social media, have managed to amass a following that appears to number in the tens of thousands of sympathizers, largely through Facebook pages, from which they can, with almost no capital investment, encourage and spark the kinds of militia groups who were plotting to murder Governor Whitmer, and they capitalize very easily on President Trump's racist and xenophobic tweets and statements. They do not believe that there should be any gun laws. They believe that they should be able to own tanks, fighter jets, and shoulder-fired missiles. Until the pandemic, I might have been inclined to believe that all these guys were just somebody's crazy uncle who could spout off paranoid-sounding lunacy, but it held no substantive threat. But among a population that doesn't want to be told to wear a mask or stay home or to socially distance, these fringe groups are gaining an audience and a frightening amount of influence. Last month in Senate hearings, the FBI Director Christopher Wray and the Division of Homeland Security Director Ken Cuccinelli both warned lawmakers that white supremacists, anarchists, and military-style groups, militia-style groups, posed a serious threat to Americans. And in response, the Trump administration insisted that they reword their statements to downplay the group's threat to America. He doesn't want, Trump doesn't want us to think of militia groups or the Proud Boys or the Wolverine Watchmen to be listed among terrorists. For him, anyone who supports him, no matter how crazy they are, are considered to be good people. These people are dangerous, and they are dangerous for one reason, and I'm going to repeat it, one reason, and that is the ready availability of military-style weapons and ammunition. Take that away from these hillbillies, and they would have to cope with their insecurities in some other way, like buying a Corvette or take up model train collecting or exploring their sexuality, you know, not saying they should, 
spend more on plastic surgery and makeup, but maybe, you know, I had to work that back in somehow. They could, for heaven's sake, get some counseling, but the one thing they do not need is access to guns. America has been held hostage for generations by elaborate and profit-driven interpretations of the Second Amendment. And in answer to my, to my British friends who reason, reasonably keep asking about this matter, America has simply lacked the political will to fight against the tide of campaign donations from the gun lobby. To do the one thing that would make sense, which is to make it illegal to sell or to own assault-styled rifles or large caches of ammunition. School shootings have not sufficiently forged our will to get this simple thing done, and I doubt that the Proud Boys, the Wolverine, Watchmen, or the Minnesota Gun Rights Group will do it either, not even if they capture and kill a couple of Democratic governors. But folks, it's time for all of us not to wait for a hero to arise in elected office, but for all of us to demand sanity from our federal government. It has become normal to accept literal insanity, completely unacceptable immorality. But Trump only gets two more months in office. And after that, rather than injecting bleach into our veins, we need to inject bleach into the walls of the White House. We need to sanitize our federal government and insist that the next government act in a responsible way and bring adult leadership back to America. Now, there's a whole list of things that really need to be corrected in the next year. And it seems like gun, sensible gun laws only gets discussed when there's been a tragic series of murders. But right now, today, I want to put that on the list for 2021. How are we going to get out of the mess that we're in now? One of the things that has to be on the to-do list is to enact sensible gun laws and reduce gun violence in America because domestic or foreign terrorists don't get to run this country anymore. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.